Good morning to you all. Uh, welcome to the Grand Hyatt, a little different venue than we, we haven't used this for a while, uh, which ho hope we try to arrange for less distraction in the swimming pool, but I can't guarantee it. Uh, but uh, I'm delighted to have you all here this morning uh, for a very, very special event. Uh, may I ask you at the outset, will I have your attention to, uh, if you have any mobile devices that uh, beep or ring or whatever, to please put them on silent uh, for uh, benefit of our speaker and, and the audience later on this morning. Uh, my name is Richard Volstek. I'm president of the American Chamber of Commerce here in Hong Kong. and It's a delight to be able to host Zach Nelson for uh, a, a interlocutor exercise of conversation with one of our members and uh, frequent, uh, you might say, host for this kind of thing, Tara, Tara Joseph, from, uh, uh, which will be introduced to you, both he and uh, Zach and Tara be introduced to him a little later this morning by Donald Austin, who is uh, our, our host for this morning. Let me just uh, give you an idea. First of all, just a couple other housekeeping things. You look around the room, you'll see we're all color-coded uh, on, with the name badges. The, uh, the red ones are board members of the chamber. Yellow, if you see a yellow one, it's a committee chair. Blue tags are members, and gray tags are people who are, have not yet been enlightened and need to, you know, need to be joining the chamber as soon as possible. Uh, so, and we, of course, we have a, a number of guests from NetSuite, uh, both at the back of the room and around the, and at the tables, that we hope before you leave today, uh, you'll be able to uh, have a chance to introduce yourselves to them as well. Uh, before, we can begin your breakfast now, but I'd like to, I'd like to introduce our head table, uh, because there are uh, some very, uh, uh, big supporters of the chamber and important members of the of the Hong Kong community with us this morning. So, uh, next to Tar first, as I say, we, uh, uh, Zach and Nelson will be introduced a little later. Tara Joseph, uh, who is uh, uh, sitting next to him at the here at the head table, uh, is a chief correspondent Asia for Reuters TV. Uh, next to her is Donald Austin, who is a member of the board of governors of the uh, AmCham here and executive director of One Consulting Services. Uh, next to him is Annie Dien, chief information office for the airport authority. Uh, glad to see you here, Andy. We don't, we don't interact as, as much except in lobbying ways on behalf of the airport, so good to have you with us this morning. Uh, Wendy Zhao, who is head of information and communications technology for Invest Hong Kong. Uh, Stefan Nauman, who is uh, the uh, chief financial officer for the uh, Zulig Group Incorporated. Uh, Nick Brook, one of the pillars of our community, who is chairman of the Professional Property Associ Associations Limited, but a player in throughout government and quasi-government and civic organizations in Hong Kong. Charles Ong, who is uh, the uh, Director General of Invest Hong Kong for the promotion side. And uh, that's our main people at the table. Please enjoy your, your uh, breakfast. There's more coming, and uh, including coffee and tea. And we'll start a little later for the discussion, the interaction, which will also, as always, include vigorous Q&A from the audience. So again, thank you for coming, and enjoy another great breakfast at the Grand Hyatt. Thank you. Hey, uh, I want to say good morning. We're going we're to get started now. I hope everyone enjoyed your breakfast. Uh, before I, I do any introductions, I want to say you need to, there's a, a, a survey form here. So you've got to fill out the survey form um, because there's, you need to do this for the lucky draw. And having been at AmCham a while, these are some exceptional lucky draw presents. So this is not, a, this is not your average lucky draw present. So I would encourage everyone to fill out the form. Richard, you need to fill out the form too. So, um, so do that at the end, and then the uh, NetSuite guys will collect those forms, put them in a box, and we'll do the lucky draw at the end. So I think that's for the admin business. So, um, so we're going to get started. So Richard asked me a few weeks ago to do the introductions for this event. I said, hey, that's no problem. Uh, my organization's been implementing NetSuite in Asia for over eight years, so we know the company really well. Yeah, 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 yeah. So this is great. <laughs> but, but now, actually, I'm pretty nervous about standing up here and doing this. It's, it's not for about Tara. So she's the chief correspondent for Reuters TV, and she actually started up the organization in Asia. 
But if, if you've lived here for a while, you've definitely seen her on the, on the news and around town at different events. So we're very glad to have you here today to lead us off. But I am a little nervous about our other guests. It's not because I remember when the company started as NetLedger. <clears throat> I was in the industry then and we all laughed, like, hey, it's a spreadsheet on the internet, big deal. But it was actually pretty far-sighted, and as you'll learn today, very successful. And it's not because a few short years after you became CEO, they were able to ramp up the innovation, really grow the company, and make an IPO in 2007, which in hindsight is pretty good timing, I think. Um, and also, it's in Silicon Valley, so there's a lot of competition. That's, that's not an easy feat. And it's not because he managed to keep and expand the NetSuite team. They continue to innovate and deliver pretty good results for both small entrepreneurial companies all the way up to enterprise sized companies. And again, that's not an easy feat. And in fact, they're the number one cloud ERP in the world. And there's a lot of competition in this space, so you'll understand how difficult that actually is to keep and hold that position. But I am nervous because exactly two weeks ago today, I saw Zach speak in front of 10,000 people. His introduction started off with blaring rock music, four guys dressed in black under neon lights, banging on drums. I can't top that. I, I can't top that, so I'm pretty nervous. We thought about some mermaids in the pool, but looking out there, I'm saying maybe not. But anyway, but I can give you a heartfelt welcome to Hong Kong. We appreciate your time and look forward to learning about, not only about the cloud, uh, you know, computing, how it works, how it can help our Hong Kong businesses, but also maybe a little bit about managing a high growth innovative company because um, we're doing that in Hong Kong as well. So, welcome guys. Thank you. Yeah. Well, good morning everyone. I just want to test the mic level before we start out. Can everyone hear me? Good. Well, good morning to you. And Zach, thanks so much for coming all the way from Silicon Valley. Uh, we've decided to have a steamy Hong Kong morning for you. It's already about 87 degrees outside. Um, so we know you're from Silicon Valley. We know you're the CEO of a big company. But tell us, to begin with, a little bit more about yourself mm -hmm. and your journey to NetSuite. Yeah, well, we're, it's the long story or the short story. My, myself, uh, I was born in the Midwest, um, grew up in Nebraska, ended up going to Stanford for university. First time I ever on a Actually, I wasn't on a plane. I took the train. My dad worked for the railroad. So I, didn't, I hadn't been on a plane yet, but I went to Stanford. And I was going to go to medical school. Um, Spent you know, four years, got accepted to medical school, uh, and before I did that, I decided to see if I actually wanted to be a, a doctor. So I spent two years in a, uh, working in a, a veterans hospital. And after those two years, I figured out everyone was sick, and I really didn't enjoy that that much. So uh, I had to change jobs quickly. I was in Silicon Valley, so I, so I managed to roll into high tech. But I, was, I had a very fortunate career in that I sort of started at the semiconductor level. I worked for Motorola in my first job, uh, then moved up to system software. I worked for Sun. Uh, on the operating system side, then went to Oracle databases, and then I went to McAfee. And uh, at McAfee, security software company, my last two jobs, you probably don't know the story of McAfee, but John McAfee, if you know him, is known as kind of a, a lunatic. Um, but as all lunatics are, he's crazy smart, and he really started three things that are important for what we're doing today. The first thing he did was create the freemium model of distribution. So this was before the internet existed, it was the ARPANET. He created this antivirus toolkit and he put it up on the internet and he said it's free for end users. But if you're a corporation, you have to buy it. And so what would happen uh, was the users loved it and then they'd bring it into the corporation and we'd call Ford Motor Company and say, you know, you have 10,000 licenses that you're not licensed for. Would you like to pay for those now? So that was, and now today if you look around the internet, the freemium distribution model is really how a lot of companies get started. But he did this in, you know, early 80s. Uh, the second thing that he did was uh, he said, when, when you pay us, we're not going to charge you a license. You know, usually software was charged a one-time license. You own the software. Thank you very much. He said, you have to pay me every two years. It's going to be a subscription to the software. And really, if you look at how cloud software companies are modeled today, that's how we do it. It's a, it's a subscription. And there are many benefits, frankly, for the customer for a subscription model, but it was... Uh, it was a genius model. So he was, you know, in, incredibly smart. But my, but so fast forward to when I was at McAfee, he had left, and he had created the internet software. By the time I'd gotten there, they'd turned McAfee into a retail box software company. So my boss at the time said, well, this internet thing really is happening now. This is 1999. Why don't we see if we can go back to John's original vision and create internet software? So we created two companies. Uh, one was called McAfee.com, which was a B2C antivirus service only over the internet. And one was a B2B antivirus service uh, called MyCIO.com, which was security 
software over the internet for businesses, and I ran that particular division. And the light bulb went off in my head when I did that uh, for a number of reasons. Um, I, I sort of realized that so all software was going to be delivered this way. And, and the simplest reason for that was in the old model of software, we would ship customer disk and dare them to install it. It was their problem. They had to run it. In this model, the guy writing the software had to run the software. And it turns out if the guy writing the software has to run the software, they write a lot better software because now the burden's on them to upgrade it and maintain it. So there was enormous benefit for the, cu for the customers. So I left at the time uh, and went looking for companies only doing internet-based software. And there were two that uh, existed. One was called NetLedger at the time, now NetSuite, but that was the first cloud application software company. And the other was called Salesforce.com. And NetLedger needed a CEO and Salesforce.com didn't, so the rest is history. It's interesting to hear your journey. Do you consider yourself a marketing and sales guy, a corporate guy, an entrepreneur, a bit of an engineer? That's what I always think of when I try to figure out Silicon Valley people, is how you put that all together and package yourself. What would you consider yourself? Well, it's evolved over time. I never really considered myself an entrepreneur, but as I look back on my career in retrospect, I was always uh, the guy in the startup division within these large companies that was trying to do something new. So at Sun, I was in the, we had, people won't remember this, but we had split the company into a bunch of business units, one of which was the Solaris operating system. So that was the group I ran. It was a startup. And it's funny, when you try to create a startup inside large companies, the large company tries to kill the startup. It's just they hate the startup, you know? Yep. <laughs> because it's, they're, you know, the startup gets all the resources and the, the big company, the big aspect of the company that's generating the revenue says, why are they getting the resources when we're generating the money? But, so that was always what I was involved in. At McAfee, I did the startups for McAfee.com and MyCIO.com. So I guess at some level, uh, I was an entrepreneur. But as I went to, but I, but I came out of the sales and, and marketing side. Um, so as I did leave McAfee to look for uh, a cloud-based software company, I knew I needed to have a couple things to complement my skill set. And one was a great engineering team. And at McAfee, our challenge there really was we had these great ideas. We didn't have the world's greatest engineering team. So uh, when I left, that was my number one priority. And NetLedger had been founded by Larry Ellison of Oracle. He was really the financier behind it. But the real founder of it was a guy named Evan Goldberg, who was our, is still our chief technology officer. And when I was at Oracle, Evan was the guy that Larry always went to when he had a hard technology challenge. So, you know, with him founding it, I knew we had the technology aspect covered. So I think if you look at Silicon Valley, you know, you always think of single people as, as sort of having founded these companies. But if you really look in the history, it tends to be a team. You know, it was Hewitt and Packard. It was, you know, Moore and Grove. It, even at Oracle, it was Ellison and a guy named Bob Miner. Ellison, while he was a programmer, Bob Miner was the programmer, right? Um, and so I, I think you always see these two-headed kind of companies, and that's what Evan and I still are today. Interesting. So on to NetSuite. It's been 17 years, almost mm -hmm. two decades. Yeah. And over the last two years, you've been shifting gears. Maybe that startup side of you coming along again. Quite mm -hmm. a few acquisitions. Yeah. Can you tell me a little bit about the direction in which you're driving the company now? Well, it's, it, it's interesting. You know, the, the foundational vision of NetSuite is still the vision we're operating on today, which says a lot about what Evan and Larry started with. You know. As, as you look at how com companies grow and how long they can live, the number one aspect is the vision of the company. That really defines your trajectory. And, and their initial idea 17 years ago was not necessarily to deliver business software over the internet, but their idea was to build a system to run a business. That was really the seminal idea. If you look at how most software is built today, it's built to run departments, an accounting app, a sales application, a website application, a support application, and then IT people try to tie all this stuff together. And that was really the conversation that Larry and Evan had early on. Evan had started a company. It failed. He started to complain about how hard it was to run a business because of this challenge. And Larry said, I have an idea. Why don't you build a system that solves that problem? And that was really the idea. And still nobody's had that idea. Still, even if you look at our cloud competition today, what they're doing is building software for the old model by department. And the real challenge businesses face is how do you go from the first time you meet a customer to the time you collect cash from them? You don't need to go across six systems to do that. So that was the foundational vision. The second idea was to deliver it over the internet, right? So two really big concepts. And in 1998, when Evan started the company, people thought it was crazy that it would never happen. Um, and now 
18 years later were geniuses, you know, so um, it's good, good to, you know, follow the vision for that long. But what happened in that intervening 18 years to actually get to the, your question is when you build software to run businesses, the type of business you're running matters, right? If, you're, if I'm making an application for a media company, we have lots of media companies, by the way, using NetSuite, your needs are different than a manufacturing company uh, building things for the iPhone. And so we figured out very early on that we would have to verticalize the applications for different types of business. And in that vein, our acquisitions are usually about uh, how do we not necessarily acquire technology, but how do we acquire domain expertise in a particular vertical? So as an example, we recently acquired a, a manufacturing company that actually built some deep manufacturing technology on NetSuite. And NetSuite, we could have figured out how to do that, but, it, but it's really more about having run a manufacturing shop floor to, to know how to do that, and we've never done that. So our acquisitions really are about extending our application uh, to the last mile of a given industry or vertical. So within the cloud that you have now, are you happy with the setup, or are you driving it into a different direction? Well, we've, we're always changing. You know, you imagine NetSuite or NetLedger, as you recall, uh, in the early days. Um, when you build an application like ERP, which is the back office, uh, it takes a long, long time to build the functionality to run a large manufacturing company or a large media company. So when you start, you can only meet the needs of the very smallest companies. Um, and what we've done now over 20 years is we've expanded from you know, small startups to companies like Procter & Gamble using us. So we've built enormous functionality. But even within that, um, you know, the way our software works is it's a single code base. Every one of our customers is on the same version, running the same software. They're running it in very different ways, obviously, but it's the same version. So uh, even today, NetSuite is running on NetSuite, and we're running the same, the first line of code that Evan wrote is still in the application. And so that's a good thing, but it's also a bad thing, as you can imagine, in that when Procter & Gamble becomes a company, we didn't ever anticipate having to deal with that order volume or that amount of inventory. And so we've had to rebuild subsystems within the applications over time to, to enable ourselves to grow and meet the needs of our customers. And so we've have a, had a couple major milestones in rebuilding that software. Uh, and again, this is why it was so important to have the amazing development team we have, because even Evan says doing this is like doing a heart transplant in a moving ambulance, right? Because we have 30,000 companies running their business on NetSuite. We cannot screw up, right? And, but we have to rebuild so these core. So how is that heart transplant going, by the way? It's fantastic. <laughs> well, it, it's, uh, I use these horrible Still metaphors. Meeting. All the salespeople are cringing, but not only is, it, is the development a heart transplant, but really convincing customers to change these systems is a heart transplant. If you think about ERP is the heart of every company, right? It's their orders, it's their invoices, it's the last system they want to change. And so no amount of cold calling that my team can do can convince a customer, hey, ER, our ERP software is on sale this month, can you, will you buy it? Um, only when the customer is sick or the patient is sick will they replace this application. And really what's happening is the cloud is causing the heart in all of these companies, not in every company to be sick. All these systems that were designed 20 years ago, SAP and Oracle and go down the list, weren't designed to run the way a modern company runs today. And that's becoming a big problem as, as companies try to transition their business models to the cloud. It sounds like a very familiar story and I wonder <laughs> if other people feel the same way within their corporate environments. So how do you push that forward? And what should companies be thinking about now as the next step? It is hard to move and change at the same time. Yeah. It's a big issue in Hong Kong innovation. Well, so we, if you think of our customers as examples of, of what to do, there's a whole host of next generation companies. I was having, uh, I went to a basketball game with the CEO of Dropbox. They were founded in 2007 when we went public. So that whole generation of software companies is born on the cloud. They just, they don't even think about installing software. They buy NetSuite and they go with it. The challenge really becomes in these larger companies um, where they have existing businesses. They have a product business or they have a service business. And now they're seeing their business changed by the cloud. I mean, media publishing is a prime example, right? You guys have been disrupted, but every industry is going to be disrupted by the cloud. And so what we see those companies doing, the larger companies doing, is they maintain their existing 20-year-old legacy system to run their legacy businesses, but every company has entrepreneurs in it, and they start spinning out the new business or the fast-moving business, and they do it on NetSuite. And so a couple of great examples here, Hong Kong Express, 
the low-cost airline. That's exactly, they're using NetSuite. They're not using uh, the corporate system. Lots of multinationals, uh, as they come to China in particular, uh, Shaw Carpets is the world's largest carpet manufacturer. They're in Georgia. They're running some ancient SAP system. But when they moved their manufacturing to China, they did it on NetSuite. Uh, Jollibee, another great example. Hundreds of instances of Oracle running in Manila. But as they opened up their 30 brands in Vietnam and China, that's all on NetSuite. So that's really what you're seeing them do, is they're putting their next generation ideas on a flexible platform, cloud-based platform. Platform. So in a chunk, as you're making these acquisitions and thinking about where companies are going, what do you want NetSuite to be if you described it to somebody who's not in the industry like myself? Well, it's, it's you know, what we do is we provide a business system that enables other companies to, to achieve their business vision. So we're really an enabler of all these great ideas that every company has, small, medium, and large. And uh, and again, it really comes from our founding. You know, when I joined NetSuite, Evan had a slide of the vision of the company. And his vision was to help entrepreneurs succeed. And we did that using this integrated application. And at first we thought there were only entrepreneurs in startups. There are entrepreneurs in every business. And in fact, it's almost more important, especially in the cloud economy, for large companies to be entrepreneurial. And so that's really our vision, is how do we take this great technology that we built, incredible product, 30,000 companies. We have, you know, nine terabytes of data are being added to our system every day by our customers. It's enormous. It's just amazing to see. And the most exciting thing for me as CEO, and I was talking to Richard about this, is if you're into business, you have no better seat than my seat because you get to see every crazy idea on the planet, right? I mean, it's the ideas that people have to, to change, you know, to, to, to change the world of business and and enable customers is amazing, and it's really just an honor to be a part of, of those, all those efforts. So from the crazy ideas to the ideas that work like a Dropbox, mm -hmm. um, wh what companies do you think are successful, um, and how can people be successful at grasping what's going on in the market right now? Well, I think, you know, the, the, my view of what's happening and what's gonna happen really for the next 100 years is the cloud is really the last computing architecture. There is, there's nothing after the cloud from a technology standpoint. You know, there's what's after all your data, business and yeah. personal, available anytime, anywhere, on any device. There's nothing. This is it. So we'll just shut off. Well, no, this, Everything will just work perfectly. No, 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 it's not shutting off. That, that's, that's the platform for the next thousand years. The really interesting thing is what companies are going to do with that platform. And you've already seen innovation that you couldn't imagine on that platform, right? Who, who thought that you could aggregate all the world's taxi demand in an application, and well, boom, suddenly, there it is, Uber. So just this platform enables things that you couldn't even imagine doing before, and that's really the challenge for large companies is to look at their business and say, okay, how's this ubiquitous network gonna change my business? And what's going on there, and you see it certainly in China and Hong Kong, this, this concept of Internet of Things is a great example of it, you know, basically embedding CPU and intelligence in physical items which then become services, you know, so product as service. We're software as a service. What IoT is about is product becoming service. And so you're going to see, you already are seeing amazing innovations on that front. Again, things I, I could have never imagined. We had a, uh, a customer on stage with me that you saw called Daiquiri, and everyone talks about virtual reality as a consumer application. These guys have made a augmented reality headset for manufacturing and technical services. So six cameras, tons of networking, you know, they can tell the person on the line what to do next to manufacture this. They can go out in the field and say, this is about to break, as the thing communicates to it and says, I'm about to break. Um, so the, just the innovation in every industry is happening. But that, I think that's also the challenge for every industry is to understa understand that every company is a cloud company, not just technology companies. But if you're a manufacturer, you know, if you're, if you're a cattle rancher, and that was when I was in uh, Manila five years ago, I was trying to think of the most absurd example of a company being a cloud company and being from the Midwest, I said, oh, if you're a cattle rancher, you're a cloud company. And what this hand shot up and the guy stood up and said, oh, I'm, I'm a farmer. I'm the sole manufacturer of Kobe beef in, in, uh, in the Philippines. And he's absolutely right. I have all my cows instrumented. They're calling back to NetSuite. They're telling me where they are in the field. They're telling me if they're sick or not. I use the e-commerce component to go to market. So it really is true. Every company is a cloud company. And if you don't determine how to embrace it and put it into your model, you'll have a challenge. So that's an interesting point. Here in Hong Kong, very few ranchers 
but a lot of people in the financial hey. industry, well, there might be some ranchers out here, you'd be surprised, yeah. but a lot of people in the financial industry, mm -hmm. manufacturing, trade, commerce obviously, what do you see as a good way for them to be thinking about using the cloud? And I know there's so much buzz around yeah. fintech as an, as an industry here, yeah. for example. Well, How to harness it? Any yeah, it's, ideas? It's, it's all up to the vision of the, the company. We have a great customer here, CLSA, in the brokerage business, one of our larger customers in Hong Kong, doing exactly that. Uh, we have manufacturing companies here doing exactly that. Um, a host of different industries doing it. And what's amazing, you know, what could be more different than financial services and manufacturing? They're both running on a common platform called NetSuite. It's pretty amazing that this technology has been able to cover, you know, the idea of running any business. Um, and so what I always, what's always exciting when I talk to those customers is the unusual ways they're trying to reflect their, bus their business strategy in our system. And that's really what we've tried to do with our system is give them a platform to, number one, reflect their businesses as exist today, but number two, experiment with new business models and new opportunities. And that's, I think, really the reason people are moving to NetSuite is that flexibility to go from the business model I'm running today to the business model I might be running tomorrow. Uh, as that's what, that's what this cloud economy is really causing companies to change is how they think about pricing, uh, packaging and going to market with their products because co consumers want to consume them in very different ways than this is a product, this is a service. They want to blur the lines between those things. So that's interesting. You've mentioned some success stories, Kobe beef, cattle ranching, CLSA. Cosmo of, supply, yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> um, what is it that do you think has made them successful in grasping on how to use NetSuite or how to move into that next phase of, of using the cloud? Is it creative use of technology? Is it a deep understanding of technology? Does it take engineers to be able to do it? Yeah. What do you think, what, what is that, that magic combination? Well, I think, I, I think it is a leap of faith. You know, we, again, we had a very different vision for the company, building a system to run a business. Nobody had ever done it. And so there is this buying behavior that says every department gets their own application. It's a horrible buying behavior, yes. by the way. That's, you end up with this, <laughs> we call it the hairball, right? It's just, you, you can't figure out what's going on in your business at all. So it does take great leadership in the company to tell everybody who wants their own application, no, we're gonna try to buy a system that actually allows us to see end to end in what we're doing. And also, oftentimes, it is the CFO, it is the CEO saying, I'm tired of everybody telling me they don't know what's going on. We have to change how we're running these systems. That's number one. The second thing that usually has to happen for it to happen is there does have to be some disruption in their industry. Again, people don't, nobody chooses to do elective heart surgery, right? Cosmetic surgery for other things, you don't just walk in to have your heart transplanted. So you have to foresee some sort of major disruption that's gonna tell you the way we're operating our business is not gonna work in the next world. So you do need that disruption. That's the second uh, aspect, I think, that comes into play in these sort of heart transplants from a legacy system to a modern system. I see that medical background coming. Uh, well, that's true. Maybe but that's it, what it, it makes sense. It wasn't all wasted. About it that's in those good. Terms. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> um, the other thing I wanted to ask: great that, to have you here in Asia. But when you look at how companies are doing their business here, how technology is unfolding here, how far behind is Asia from certainly the United States or, or maybe even Europe? I don't. I, uh, you know, when you come here from America, you certainly see ways that Asia is way ahead of you know, really? North America. Well, mobile was always so much bigger here. Um, just the infrastructure that you have here. I mean, it's pretty amazing uh, to see the amount of it. I just came from Singapore, so I'm in the two greatest lands of infrastructure investment. And it's, you know, it's far ahead, I think, of the US in that regard. Uh, I think in terms of cloud adoption, you know, the, the cloud works generally where you live in a distributed world, right? If you look at the early days of NetSuite, um, when we started the company, nobody believed you'd, do, you'd use applications for running a business. But there were two industry groups where the fact that they had any time access to the data outweighed their security concerns. And the first was people that made products or sold products because those businesses were distributed by nature. They had manufacturing in China, they had distribution warehouses all over the place, so they wanted an application they could access anytime, anywhere. The second kind of company was, was, had similar needs but totally different, and they were services companies. They wanted their people out in the field servicing and, and, then, and then had access to the system to tell the company what they were doing. So when you look at that sort of as the baseline, everyone in Asia op operates their business in a distributed fashion. They don't just want to do business in China, or if you're in Singapore, you want to do business 
in Malaysia, in China, and so to have a ubiquitous business system that understands all of those currencies, all of those taxes, um, actually solves a ton, ton of problems for you that the old model doesn't solve. So in many ways, the cloud as a platform, and in particular, the way we've built business applications on the cloud, uh, suits the Asian market more than it suits the U.S. market, right? The U.S. market, you can just stay in the U.S. and never leave. You don't need, it's a large geography, but you don't need to go to other countries to be successful. Here, I don't think that's the case. And so, uh, so I, everybody always says Europe's behind or China's behind. I don't think anybody's really behind. What's probably behind in China is NetSuite. You know, we don't have enough people here. We don't have enough mm. resource here to take advantage of the opportunity. That's, that's how I would view it. Do you feel comfortable about the access that you have to Asian markets? And I'm thinking China in particular in terms yeah. of sales and functionality, or is that a big issue for well, you? And Yeah, Greater China has always been sort of a mystery to me. <laughs> so may, am I not alone in that? That's I good. Many of us uh, <laughs> spend our lives <laughs> engaging in this. But, but um, so, so that's something I think over the next couple of years we really have to evaluate as a, 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 you know, a maker of intellectual property, we're always concerned about the intellectual property walking out the door. And so that's, I think, made us sleep double, doubly resident about mainland, not, not so much Hong Kong. But I think, uh, you know, obviously it's a huge opportunity. You know, we say, the, what NetSuite tried to create was a system to fill the gap between an entry-level infrastructure in the U.S. It would be QuickBooks. I don't know what it is here, Sage or something. At the high end, there's SAP and Oracle. And we're trying to fill the gap really in between that. And so we call that in the U.S. the Fortune 1 million. Here it's the Fortune 50 million. You know, that's how many companies there are between entry level, and so it's an enormous opportunity for us, and we just have to crack the code on China. So if anyone has any suggestions, I'm all ears. Well, I'm sure people have questions, um, maybe some suggestions as well, so I don't want to take up all the time asking questions. Uh, we have a microphone, I believe, in the room. If you'd like to ask a question, do give us your name and organization as well. Who'd like to get started? Start over at the CLSA table. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Zach. That was helpful, and uh, uh, let's stand up so that uh, you can uh, see my see me while asking the question. But uh, just want to get your views uh, that uh, you have a vision to grow in Asia. I'm sure uh, you have a lot of customers back in US. What's your view on, uh, we just uh, onboarded the product. Uh, we are overall, we are still going through the issues and initial. We have a bit of the, the market, Hello? Yeah, there you go. Maybe right Hello, there. better now? Yeah. Okay. So we just onboarded the product and uh, uh, right now we are going through the uh, teething issues, the initial uh, user training and those kind of things, right? So I'm pretty sure with the help of uh, team in Asia, we should be able to uh, achieve what we want to achieve. Yeah. I, uh, as a CEO for the technology, uh, CLSA, I believe, strongly believe in the product. It is uh, definitely uh, completes our need. So uh, uh, definitely believe in the product and its capability. But uh, uh, while going through this journey from last year and uh, now going live and also going to this issue, just want to get uh, your view on overall support structure. Yeah. Because for any product, right, uh, in order to be successful, yes, product should have great ideas and great, I think NetSuit has that, I believe yeah. in that, right? But what's your view or what's your vision in terms of support and service? Yeah. yeah? It's an interesting question, you know, we, so to take a, a broader view of it, you know, if you look at their, this model is very different than the traditional software model on a number of fronts. And I think there are sort of four core pieces of IP that we focus on building. Two are on the product side. How do you build the functionality for a company like yours or a company like Cosmos Supply? That's one product effort. Secondly is how do you deliver the bits efficiently, cost effectively? So those are really two operational uh, pieces. Um, the other two pieces are really go to market pieces. You know, how do you reach the Fortune 50 million, right, to tell them about this uh, great opportunity? And then last but not least, even small businesses, actually I think small businesses are far more complicated to run than big businesses, right? You don't have 100 IT people, you don't have the expertise. And so if you look at all the four components, building the technology, distributing the technology, reaching the Fortune 5 million, and then service and supporting people doing very complex things regardless of size in the application, that's actually the hardest problem to solve. Um, you know, I always say it's sort of like, we, it, it's like trying to implement and support SAP with many zeros missing off the purchase order, right? Because very expensive, 
because you're doing complicated things and, and, and you know, you're a mid-sized company. So we spend an enormous amount of time working on that. We've evolved our model uh, quite a bit, and, I, and we continue to try to innovate on that. So a couple of the things we're trying to do, in particular in how do you deliver that service component cost effectively and efficiently, um, is number one, we're trying to package more and more functionality for industry so it's obvious that a financial services company, this is the starting package and things are really transparent versus have to, having to customize. So we have a big program underway to really industrialize the solution for different types of companies. Um, second thing we're doing is we really are changing our services model. You know, our old services model, very different than a traditional services model. We really focused on getting the customer up and running quickly. That was the job. Um, we'd never really built a services team to stay with the customer and help them use it over time. Our, our, our methodology was more to how much knowledge can we transfer to this customer so that they can run the system themselves. And so we are beginning now to change that to actually have, horrible term, but installed base services. So as companies grow and evolve, if they don't have the expertise in-house, we hopefully have expertise online to, uh, with humans to be able to support that. The third thing, obviously, is we're trying to build our partner community as well. Right? If you look at the gap between very low-end ERP products and very high, it was t traditionally serviced by a vast array of value-added resellers. Um, and so that's the third piece of the puzzle that we work on are, are partnerships to try to support that. So the NetSuite team is here from Asia, so maybe we can, you can connect with them and see if there's partners or, or what specifically you all might need to, to uh, you know, perfect the system. But is that a challenge for an American company overseas? And, and working for a multinational myself in Asia, a lot of the, the programs, a lot of the people who put those programs into place are all based in the United yeah. States. So if you're growing in Asia, how do you manage to provide that sort of widespread support in a different time zone so the person calling at 10 a.m. Yeah. doesn't get an answering machine right. or an, a no answer for 12 hours? Well, we, so, so the four pieces of IP, we knew that those, that last piece, how do you support customers with several zeros missing off the purchase order, was the most important one to crack. And we actually almost, I would say, three quarters of our service and support people are in Asia. We have probably 1,500 people in Manila. And we did Manila, um, not because it was so much low cost, but they crank out CPAs, chartered accountants by the truckload. And you couldn't pay a CPA in Hong Kong a million dollars to do product support. There, we found hundreds of them, thousands of them, really. And so we actually have a ton of resource in Asia. Um, I think it's really just more how do you uh, apply that resource across geography, perhaps more efficiently. And, and I, you can't under, underestimate the value of these partners. We, because we are a cloud-based system, we've tried to build our model around delivering our services remotely over the internet. Um, and while that works in many cases, there's nothing better than having a human actually show up and help you through problems. And so our partner community, local partners, I think, are still very important. And, so, and, that, and that we haven't done as well in, I think, in Asia. Um, from a service and support standpoint, we have you know, a thousand bodies here ready to do it. Good to know. Questions? Start over here Hi, Jeff McClellan from CO Connect. Um, Zach, um, could you just comment and contrast your business strategy and your business model against Amazon, Google, Microsoft? Yeah, so, it's, so uh, they're two pretty, they're fundamentally different in the sense of what Amazon and Google and Microsoft, Azure for Microsoft, AWS for Amazon, and I can't remember what Google's platform is called, maybe Google platform, I don't know. Um, but by the way, Alphabet's a customer, so I, I love Google, don't get me wrong. Microsoft and Amazon are not customers, so I, Microsoft's my favorite, uh, or Google's my favorite. Um, but what they're really doing is they're trying to provide just raw infrastructure for companies to come and build whatever application they want to build. Um, we did something very different. We decided to actually build an application, right? So our application runs businesses. What you see people using Amazon and Google for is uh, in corporations, oh, I need to spin up a quick application to do X, Y, Z. They've got hardware. They've got databases. Let me go write that application on their platform. You see very few commercial applications written on Amazon, Google, and, uh, and Microsoft. Uh, most people that write commercial business applications, like ourselves, uh, own the whole stack. We own the hardware. We own the database. We build the application. There are a whole bunch of reasons for that, but really the 
the main reason is, ultimately, we're responsible for the service level for application. And so we feel it's important to control every aspect of it. If we were to have built it on Amazon, if we could have, if Amazon ever has a problem, who are they going to bring up first? Right? Probably not my customers. Maybe my customers. I'm big. Um, and so it was really about controlling the customer experience, why we built the stack, and why I think most application vendors build their own stack. Netflix is probably the largest company using AWS, um, but I can't think of another application, per se, uh, application that's actually sold that's on those platforms. So with that in mind now, who is your major competition? Is it these types of applications or is it other big companies doing the kind of commercial applications that you're doing? Yeah, it's, it's you know, again, when we started, everybody, you know, laughed at us, including our competition, which was fantastic. Um, as Larry Ellison says, if, if people tell you you're crazy, you're probably onto something really big. And so that was where we started. And about three years ago, you know, the competition sort of woke up and said, oh, Maybe people will do hard things on the cloud. So everyone is certainly talking about how they have cloud solutions. But at the end of the day, it took us 20 years to build NetSuite. How long will it take SAP to build NetSuite? About 20 years, if they do it right. I mean, this is, this is not something you do overnight. It's very complex, very deep functionality. And in fact, SAP had tried to do it three or four years ago and failed completely. So uh, the, the, real, the real thing that's happening here, that's not to say they're a bad company or anything. It's just as an example. But when you go through these major technology dislocations, the companies that were the leaders in the previous technology never make the transition. You know, main, IBM did not become the client server leader, right? It was Microsoft and others. In the same way, it's very unlikely that those companies will become the leaders in cloud computing. And it's, it's because everything we're doing is the antithesis of what they do, right? They hand a disk to the customer and tell them to run it. We run the software. Uh, they sell them a one-time license. We charge them a subscription over time, which it invests us in making sure they're continually successful. So both from a technology standpoint and a business model standpoint, we're the complete opposite company. It's very hard to disrupt yourself to make that transition. So from your Silicon Valley perch point and also your own company perch point, are we in a constant phase of innovation and disruption, or do you think we're at a particular phase right now? No, I, I believe this cloud platform, as I said, this is the last architectural disruption you'll see, certainly in our lifetimes, our children's lifetimes, you know, a thousand years. But I think what the cloud enables is continual disruption of business models. And I think that's the challenge for every company. Is, that sounds like a challenge. Yeah, you don't want to be <laughs> Ubered, you don't want to be Groupon, you don't want to, what, you know, go down your list of ideas that small companies had that disrupted major industries. And so, um, so really, it's that requirement that you have to continually change your business, frankly, that's what's driving people to NetSuite, because our platform is incredibly flexible in terms of being able to change on a dime. And, uh, but I, I, think, I think business is going to be in a continual state of disruption. Donald. OK, we have five minutes to go. So Just following on that, how? Um, so it's constant disruption. How do you keep the innovation going at NetSuite? I mean, certainly there's a lot of talent in, in, in your part of the world, and people can leave and do other things. How do you keep it running? Well, we're so we're, so we're you very, don't get replaced. <laughs> we're very lucky. So, and a lot of our luck comes from the fact we are a cloud company. One of the most important things as you look at your industries being disrupted by the cloud is the power of the cloud is the ability to aggregate massive amounts of data, right? So, as I said, we have companies every day they're adding nine terabyte nine terabytes of information about their business every day in our systems. We can see all that data. Um, if you look at LinkedIn, you know, who thought you could aggregate all the world's resumes? Well, they're not doing it to aggregate the world's resumes. They're doing it to mine all that data about people, jobs, titles, etc. And so as you look at building the cloud into your companies, it really is it's about changing how you approach the customer, but it's also about enabling yourself to analyze the data that you're suddenly aggregating and understand how you have to change your business as a result of that. So, you know, as I sit as the CEO of NetSuite, we have the world's largest database about business anywhere on the planet. Our customers every day are telling us in nine terabyte chunks what they need next. And that's what's allowed us, we talked about some of the innovations in NetSuite, to innovate on the platform. We look at what our customers are doing and we can see before they can see 
what the trends are in their business. And the biggest trend that we've identified really over the last three years is this, because we have product companies, that was our first vertical, and we have service companies, that was our second vertical. Nobody's ever built a system to run a product business and a service business. And what we're seeing happening in the world, what the cloud is doing is merging those two business models. That's what we've observed. And so we put an enormous amount of effort, as example, into the business problem of doing that, of a, proud, a product company becoming a service company and a service company becoming a product company, it pops up in the billing system. Because now you have to bill companies for product, for time, for subscription, for usage. We didn't dream that up. We saw it happening in our customers. And now we're the only company on the planet that can actually solve that problem. So it's just an example as you build cloud applications for yourself. Uh, and second generation cloud companies figured this out. First generation companies, we figured it out accidentally. But if you look at what Dropbox, LinkedIn, Snap, all these companies are doing is they're building a business intelligence business. They're, they're just trying to gather data to do things with the data. And, uh, and that's really what you have to look at. That's the power of the cloud is aggregating previously unaggregatable stuff. We have time for one more question from the floor, right over here. Morning, Shaq. Simon Kong from LGP. Um, NetSuite has been a forerunner in the, in the cloud-based ERP and, and, and financial management. Um, I'd like to know what's next on your radar in terms of next wave of NetSuite services and products. Thank you. Well, the really, the really big thing I, I sort of indicated at, there, at it is this collision of business models we see in our customer base, product companies becoming service companies and vice versa. And where the challenge in that is popping up is in the billing system. How do you, and, bill, and people talk about CRM and they think of Salesforce. What's a more important customer relationship management technology than getting the invoice right? That's number one CRM in our book, right? And so when you start now having very complex billing, which every company now has, that's an incredibly difficult technology challenge to solve. I, we've solved it, I think. And then related to that, for the CFOs in the audience, you're gonna get very excited now. Um, it's not just about billing, it's about how you recognize the revenue. So what's happened is accounting, industry accounting standards boards have recognized this collision of business models and they've made the revenue recognition challenges incredibly complicated. So it's not just about invoicing, it's then about how you turn that into statutory revenue. And so the, probably the biggest thing we've done in five years is don't get, you know, CFOs get excited about this, unified billing and RevRec. And I, I tell you, I think we're the only company on the planet that has had visibility into that problem. Uh, and now we have a solution for it. So that's huge. And that's just beginning. Um, you know, what's after that, as I said, the good news is we have our customers telling us every day what's next. Uh, and so we continue to mine that data and, and look for the next, the next big thing. So just to wrap it up with a few points from you, uh, instead of the vision thing at the end of this discussion, yeah. I'd love to hear some practical do's and don'ts for people in business as to how they should be using cloud applications and what to think about if they want to build more functionality and flexibility into their own organizations. What are some practical tips they can take away? Well, I think, you know, if you're a large company, I think you really do have to look at this. Uh, you know, there was a dream when the first client server business apps were launched that, oh, oh, finally we'll have all of our companies on one instance of SAP. And in fact, I've met companies, Cargill was an example. We have a 17 year roadmap to get all of our companies on SAP. And it's like, 17 years? I mean, how, you're, are you kidding me? I mean, the world's changing every day. How can that be your roadmap? So I think what you really have to do if you're a large uh, multinational is to look at your businesses and say, what's the right solution for my fast growing businesses versus my not fast growing businesses? And that's the opportunity for you to begin to embrace some of these technologies like NetSuite, which were designed for fast growing businesses. For, next generation ideas. Uh, I think the second opportunity is, is what I've been talking about, is how to turn your own company into a cloud company. And I think there are really sort of three rules for becoming a cloud company. Number one is you, you have to think about ultimately how, you ag how you're gonna aggregate the data, because that's the power of a cloud company is the data that they own. So that's, build that into the model of creating a cloud business. Uh, secondly, how do you create, how do you function in a hybrid business model, a product business, service business and a product as service. Those are the three business models that you're gonna have to manage. Um, uh, and finally, you have to have a, a system that can adapt to change because as we said, this is gonna be continual disruption of every business. And you wanna be the disruptor, not the disruptee. So those are really the three, I think, takeaways. 
my big takeaway, be a disruptor, not, not a, a disrupt disruptee. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Zach, thank you very much for coming to talk thank to you. us today. Good Welcome honor. to Asia. Thank you. Hope to have you back. <laughs> All right. No, that's great. Thank you very much. So if you haven't filled this out, are you guys going to pick these up somewhere? We're going to do the lucky draw. So fill them out, pick them up. But before we do that, so we do, we really appreciate you guys helping us out today. And education got a little gift for Fantastic. you. Fantastic. Yeah. Thank you very much. Wonderful. <laughs> Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you. So who's, uh, Thank you. we have the lucky draw stuff right now? May you have to, are you going to draw? Yeah.